Yeah, and we have started now computing uh, the contributions coming from these new terms. We are finished with the first one, which was p squared squared divided by 8 m cubed c squared. Oh, actually, we have written it in a nicer way. As p squared over 2m squared divided by twice mc squared. This way of re rewriting also enabled us to compute it easily because the denominator numerator is the uh, kinetic energy squared divided by the rest mass energy, so thus the dimension is energy, which is a consistency check, and it enabled us to compute it rather quickly. The second term was the so-called spin orbit term. We have been able to construct it to a certain degree up to that factor which we had to uh, correct it uh, with the experimental input. And the last term was the Darwin term, as I said, we have just borrowed it from relativity. We have no way of sort of having a feeling or uh, being able to construct it. And last time we have computed the contributions coming from these two terms, first order, corrections to the energy, let me write them down because we have done it so we can just copy the result that we had. The first one I denote accordingly as delta E1. It is En0 alpha squared over N 1 over L plus a half minus 3 quarters of 4N Remember the original uh, complicated form, it was rather amazing that we could reduce it to that very nice form. En0 is the energy uh, eigenvalue of the Coulomb Hamiltonian. And delta E2, we have computed to be En minus En0 alpha squared over N. Perhaps I have to put the minus inside to be consistent with the result you had. Instead of writing plus L, I will write as we have obtained, because moving the sign from the inside to outside. But this was the original form that I have written. L equals zero. I haven't discussed this, but let's remember once we write it down, I will remind you what I mean by that. Minus L for J equals L plus a half and L plus one for J equals L minus a half. Notice that for the spin orbit we had to really have these three sets of results. Why? Because the addition of angular momentum requires, it is part of that algebra that the total angular momentum eigenvalue has two possible values, L plus a half and L minus a half and the result should obviously be expressed separately for each. That's what we have done. We haven't had a chance to comment on this. It was uh, more or less obvious remembering the numerator of the starting point of this, s dot l. s dot l is what j squared minus l squared minus s squared. So if l is equal to zero, Thus, J is equal to, let me, okay, it may sound a bit trivial, but still, let me remind you of this. J is the total angular momentum, is the sum of the spin and orbital angular momentum. If L is equal to zero, J is directly equal to S. If J is equal to S, thus J squared minus L squared minus S squared, L drops 
j is equal to s, they cancel, so it is equal to zero. So we should have seen it at the beginning, that for l equals zero, it's automatically zero, and for l different than zero, there are two possibilities. One is j equals l plus a half, the other is j equals l minus a half. So we have these two terms in hand. What have we have to do next is focus on this last one and contribute to compute the contribution and then we have to add up the three and come up with that very nice compact formula some of you have seen previously. It's a beautiful result that we could come up with even at this level of quantum mechanics. Okay, let me proceed with the third one as promised. We, have, we are going to compute the expectation value of this. You may say, why expectation value? What we are supposed to be doing is compute the matrix representation in the degeneracy subspace. Degeneracy subspaces are labeled by n. n is fixed, so it is what either ls or j maj, mj, right? So in here, obviously, there's no spin again. We can, we can use the uncoupled basis, that is LML basis is sufficient. And does that make this diagonal? Remember the algorithm? We say if the perturbation, we can find a basis in which this thing is diagonal, then the diagonal elements are automatically the corrections that we are looking for. Well, obviously, this is diagonal because of the form of the space-dependent delta. It is diagonal, therefore LML basis is perfect, all right? We don't have to resort to the spin. LML times SMS, SMS factors out, and spin decouples. And the radial part, uh, orbital part, is sufficient to finish the computation. So that's why I say, instead of the matrix representation, I say the expectation values, automatically the diagonal elements we are computing. So delta H3 expectation value is pi H bar squared E squared divided by twice MC squared delta cube R is the expectation value in what basis? NLM. NLM basis automatically for the reason I explained a minute ago. The spins decouple, factor out, factors out. So what is this? Expectation value, this is equal to d cube x psi. Well, in the first, let me write it in the conventional form. That's the definition of the expectation value, right? If the presence of delta forces you to set the r equals zero, and you, what you get out is psi of zero, that's a funny notation I know, of squared. It turned out to be quite simple. Well, not that simple, really, because there is so much which goes into this. Delta H3 is then pi h bar squared e squared divided by twice m squared c squared psi of zero squared. It is interesting that the, <coughs> the value of the wave function at the origin it plays an important role. By the way, this uh, formula is an interesting formula and it is used heavily in the high energy physics in the construction of quark cornea. That is, when you construct mesons out of quarks and antiquarks, and when you compute the mass spectra in high energy physics, then you obviously you need these kind of perturbation techniques, and again, you meet the wave function at the origin. Now, it, it takes us to an important point, right? Uh, what are those wave functions which do not vanish at the origin? We are talking about hydrogen wave functions, obviously. It's not the, the most general central potential class. You have to check on your own for different kind of potentials. For example, what is the radial oscillator, R squared? Whatever we say in here for the hydrogen, would that be valid for the three-dimensional radial oscillator? I don't know. 
for the time being. We are focusing on the specific coulomb potential and the behavior of the wave functions for that class at the origin. Now I claim that only the S waves of the psi hydrogen wave function, functions are the ones which do not vanish at the origin. So claim <laughs> only S waves that is L equals zero class all L equals zero class contribute If you want, you have to remi remind yourself that it is psi in LM. Even put a zero saying that that is the uh, uh, wave function of the naive Coulomb, right? What are the forms of it that lets me remind you the form of the psi in LM? R, R, N, L, R, Y, L, M, theta phi, right? This is the Coulomb wave function, it nice the factors between the angular and the radial parts. Obviously for this discussion it is this radial part which plays a role. This is purely geometrical and it doesn't have anything to do with the radial businesses. They are the common eigenfunctions of the L squared and LZ, so they are there. We have to focus our attention on the radial part to discover whether that thing is indeed which part it comes that non-zero contribution. My claim is that it's going to be only the L equals zeros. And there are several ways of looking into that. I can give you several hand-waving arguments or just look at the RNLs, the table of RNLs, and then let's do that for, you know, instead of going through some general problems, general uh, formulas, you can just check the R's and come up with a thumb rule saying that ah oh, these are the these are the L equal zero class which do not doesn't vanish at the origin. Let me give you several examples. For instance, what is the R one zero? If n equals one, there is only one value for L n equals zero. So R one zero is the only one associated with the n equals one. What is the expression? Some normalization constants let me denote it as such instead of writing it and crowding the board. So it is uh, R divided by R0, A0. We all know this, right? This is the uh, ground radial part of the ground state, n equals 1 case, and I'm writing the L equals 0. By default, L can only have the 0 value anyway. What is the behavior of this when R goes to 0? It goes to that constant, and that's not zero. Uh -huh. We have discovered already that the ground state, which has only this radial part, it doesn't vanish at the origin. And let me just to illustrate the point, write two other things. For this is n equals one, and that's n equals two. For n equals two, L has only two values, zero and one. If I write the two, uh, R to zero, there are these constants which I denote, just I invented the notation instead of writing those irrelevant things. One minus R, two, R divided by two A zero. A zero, remember, was the Bohr radius. A to the minus R divided by two A zero. So if I take the R goes to zero limit, Again, you see that this goes to one, that goes to zero, and it goes to that particular constant, which I denoted the radial normalization constant. In order to, even at this level, this is not really, this is an inductive way of doing things, but of course, this is not the most general way of doing things. Let me write down the R2 one, just to have a feeling. It is a, a, another constant, obviously, times, R over A0 times E to the minus R divided by 2A0. So if again, if I go to R goes to zero limit here, what do I get? Ah, all of a sudden I see zero. That's nice. Now 
Well, you just turn on uh, quantum mechanics books, the final chapters of the Sakurai or some middle chapters of the Gezira, well, whichever. You just go through the tables. You are going to see that all of them are and zeros, all of them. They, when R goes to zero, they go to a norm, the radial normalization constant, which I denote as N0, which is different than zero. And R and else, when L is different than zero, when R goes to zero, it goes to <coughs> zero. All of them, when they are not s phase, they vanish at the origin. The only one which, which do not vanish, irregardless of the value of the n, is the s waves. That's only those n equals zeros. Perhaps I can, uh, although I don't know whether it would be a waste of time, some of these things you have seen, I'm sure, one of the previous courses. But let me, just for intellect, intellectual curiosity, let me write down the radial equation and try to give you a sort of a more profound argument on some of these things. So what if you remember the form of it, that's symbolic, the psi equals r radial part times the angular part, and when you substitute that form in the Schrodinger equation, and after writing r equals little u divided by r, you have seen this in 431, even in quantum physics 300 or 547, whichever, this several times by now. Then you can write a reduced radial equation for that little u. By the way, however, here you have to note that in order to have a physical condition that this doesn't blow up at r equals zero, you have to have this physical boundary condition. So when you introduce that little u, you force it to vanish because when r goes to zero, if it doesn't vanish, there is a r in the denominator is going to blow up. That's not a physical solution, of course. So to force it to be, sort of uh, have a chance not to blow up, you have to have that also zero. So zero by zero, you can regularize it, right? To make it finite. So if you write now the equation for this little u, it's going to have the following form, very familiar for all of you, d squared u dr squared plus v plus h bar squared over 2m l times l plus 1 divided by r squared u let me, although not aesthetical, let me put that u to this. So that's the form of the equation. It's a one-dimensional equation. One-dimensional, however, on the half line, not on the full axis, right? Because r ranges from infinity to zero. So this is a half-line problem. It is not fully one-dimensional. Well, obviously, for uh, reasons that it didn't fit there, I put the u in here. The u must be put in here, right? Sort of this is related to the kinetic. That's the effective potential energy, energy eigenvalue. So uh, what is the behavior of the solution u around the origin? Origin is a very important region because notice that that brings an, a, an additional infinite barrier at the origin to stop the electron to fall on the nucleus. Because if the electron has no barrier, it falls on the nucleus, of course the atoms will not be stable, right? So Darwin term for, for that reason plays a very important role. Anyway, so what is the behavior about the R equals zero when you are around the R equals zero region? If you look at that equation, remember V is the Coulomb potential minus E squared over R. What is the most dominant terms out of this, that, and that? This is a constant, negative or positive. Here it's irrelevant. That is 1 over R. When you come close to the origin, which one is largest? 1 over R squared is obviously largest. So the equation has the following form, minus H1 squared over 2M d squared u dr squared plus h bar squared over 2m l times l plus 1 divided by r squared u. What is the meaning of this? 
This is an approximate equation. The exact equation is that one. This is the approximate equation around the origin. Because when this term becomes large, I drop the constant term, which is obviously becomes irrelevant when this becomes very large. And this is 1 over r. This becomes faster. Lar la this becomes large faster than the first term. So this is the approximate equation. If I multiply or divide both sides by the h bar squared over 2m, this equation becomes a nicer one, which can be solved rather easily. So this is the form of the equation. How do we solve these equations? We propose an ansatz. Alpha is just any number for the, in that region this uh, power, uh, power law behavior. Take the first derivative and the second derivative and substitute them what you get. Alpha times alpha minus 1 minus L times L plus 1 times R to the alpha is 0 about the origin. That's the form of the equation. And how do you satisfy that. It's not, it's, it's close to the origin, but not exactly at the origin, because if it is automatically zero, it vanishes. This coefficient should be equal to zero. Now how do you solve that? Alpha squared minus L squared minus alpha minus L. So there are two roots. Alpha one is equal to minus L. Alpha two is equal to L plus one. All these minus L's and L plus ones come popping up all of a sudden. So for these two options, let's see what we get for the U. For the first solution, we have R to the minus L. For the second solution, we have about the origin. And what about... Uh, the, what's the physical boundary condition? Physical boundary condition is u0 equals 0. What was L? L is the orbital angular momentum, which goes from 0 to n minus 1, positive number. That's a positive number, so it is 1 over r to the something. So if you set r equals 0, it blows up, so it doesn't satisfy that. does not satisfy boundary condition at the origin. So it's not physical. You, you throw it. Physics is not mathematics. You use the mathematical tools, but always the physical principle dictate the, the relevant results of nature. So that's not a physical solution. This is the physical one. Indeed, it satisfies the boundary condition. It vanishes. So that's good. If that is good, what is the R associated with this one? It is R to the L. That's R. For L different than zero. For all L different than zero, for a given N. So all these physical solutions, let me erase some so that we don't get confused. All this R class, they vanish at the origin. So what we I discovered is that all L different than zero so radial solutions vanish at the origin. But this doesn't, of course, guarantee that L equals zeros do not vanish at the origin. It may just so happen that they also vanish at the origin. So if that is the case, then the Darwin term would be zero. But I have checked some of these examples indicating that n equals zeros for n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, look at all the tables, they do not vanish. So these two, and at least, constitute a complete set of saying that I have to focus on the n equals 0. So this result will be taken with n equals 0 the only, as the only non-vanishing one. So a better notation would be then, I have to write it there, the following. So delta H3 expectation value in the NLM is pi 
h bar squared e squared divided by 2 m squared c squared psi n 0 0 0 squared. I have taken into account the fact that it is L equals zero. Okay. Well, that doesn't, of course, finish the problem to the desired level only. That gave us a beautiful sort of theorem. So how do we finish this theorem? How do I compute this psi at the origin? I will try to uh, go as fast as possible, but let me see I can do it quickly. Now there is this theorem, let me write that theorem. I don't want, this is actually, I hesitate to go through it because this is part of the 547 class. Either I can borrow it from the generalized virial theorem, let's see. Okay, let me write the theorem down and let me see whether I can quickly go through it. Now here is the Theorem, psi n zero, zero squared is equal to m two pi h bar squared dB dr s wave. Well, this is a virial theorem of the generalized type. We have seen the simpler versions of that virial, of, this is a more involved, more developed version of the virial theorem. Previously, by considering the expectation value of a naive quantity like R dot P, and using the fact that any observable, including this one, will have a time-independent expectation value in the stationary states, you can use that general theorem relating V, the kinetic energy, and the total energy terms as equalities, as I said, either one-halves or halves. I'm not writing the results down because that's not part of this class. Now, this is a more generalized virial theorem than these. These are the conventional virial theorem. This is a generalized one. So I invite you, some of you in the previous years have seen that I have given the proof of the detailed proof of this. It is a bit involved, I have to warn you. It's a higher level of Virial theorem. Please keep yourself busy a little bit. Try to try trying to prove this. Notice that L equals zero is there. So this is the S value, expectation value of the dVdr, and there is these interesting constants in the front. Obviously, it's a very powerful theorem, right? Giving you the, the value of the wave function at the origin, which is relevant not only for quantum mechanics but also for many other fields of physics including high energy physics and, and the quarkonium problems. So if V is 1 over R, we are going to have the hydrogen atom. And you may have many other, a larger class of central potentials. 1 over R squared, 1 over R to the any power, or R squared, or R simply linear. And you know quark, anti-quark physics involve many complicated combinations of all these radial terms. Therefore, whatever they are, it's not important. You can have the value of the wave function at the origin beautifully through this sum rule, which is a virial, generalized virial theorem. This is the simple virial theorems.
as compared to the generalized one. So what I will do is now use that uh, theorem to predict this, to substitute up and finish the contribution, and also remembering that it is delta L for L equals zero only, meaning there is a delta L zero there all the time. It doesn't contribute for L non-zeros. Fine. Okay, so here is the V minus E squared over R, the naive Coulomb. Let me take the radial derivative of this. It is E squared over R squared. So I have the right hand side. Well, instead of writing right hand side, let me write it as such m divided by 2 pi h bar squared times e comes out 1 over r squared s wave. So the result unfolds, but I have to warn you, actually, as I said, the real crux the real intellectual challenge is to proving this theorem. Once you have proved this theorem, this is a simple arithmetics, right? Sort of primary school arithmetic, taking the derivative and writing the result down. So don't think that it's a simple problem. That one is not simple. So we take it from the tables. We have already tables of that expressions. What is it? 1 over r squared is We have used it previously, so you are familiar with that. A0 squared, the dimensions match. N cubed, L plus a half. Is this the result? No, of course not. I have to have the L equals zero of that, because this is the expectation value of the one over R squared for S waves, L equals zero. So the result relevant for me, for me is twice A0 squared, n cube. If I set L equals zero, so two comes up as, so that is the result. So finally, psi of zero squared is m e squared divided by two pi h bar squared twice a zero squared n squared. These go away, okay? So what are the remaining things? Let me write them down. m e squared divided by pi h bar squared a0 squared. What's a0? a0 is h bar squared over m e squared. We have been using this very extensively last time. Remember, this is the a0 squared. So, repeating the same type of arguments that we are familiar with from last time. So there's a 1 over pi, let me keep it in here. And there is e squared 2 and 2, 4 e to the 6, divided by h squared h to the 6, h to the 6th, and there is m squared up, m cube. That's all, right? h squared. John, the n cube is going for? n cube is going for. n cube is going for. n cube is going for. Bravo. Onu da koyalım bunun yanına. Constantlarımızı etkilemeyecek ama sonucumuzu etkileyecek. n cube burada. Sanırım... <gülüyor> Doğru gidiyoruz, değil mi? Powerlarımız doğru mu arkadaşlar? Önce ona bakalım. M e squared 
Yes, a0 squared is h bar squared over me squared. Check your notebooks from last time. This was the a0, right? I, I don't want to make any mistake in there, right? Correct. So, m to the 4, you know, m squared, then there's another m, m cubed, e to the 6, indeed correct, h to the 6, that is correct, 2. So somehow still there is something strange going on, but let me see. E to the 4. Let me finish the result. So what do we get out of this? Let me write down the result for you. The result is, first of all, perhaps you have to uh, see that we can form a what? Alpha cube, correct? Uh, and after that, uh, uh, there is something wrong with this. H bar over. Ah, this is yet psi zero squared, of course. This is yet psi zero squared. Why do I panic? We have to. Uh, comp okay, fine. Let me put. This is yet psi zero squared. Then I have to do. The, I have to do the following to come up with the correct. Delta E3. What is delta E3 then? Delta E3 is, of course, we have erased it, right? Ah, that's the one. So delta E, delta, still delta H3, expectation value is pi h bar squared e squared divided by 2m squared c squared times the psi 0 squared that I had in here, which is 1 over pi e to the 6 m cubed divided by h bar to the 6th. And let me factor 1 over n cube out. So I had the good reason to panic because the constants were not matching to the alpha to the 4. We have to catch alpha to the 4, right? Part of the alpha squared is going to go to en0. Another alpha squared suppression will be coming. Now we are having it. 8. Pi is cancelled nicely. That's uh, totally outside. Thanks for e to the 8. Do, uh, there is an m in here. The remaining m, that's also correct. mc squared will give you the en0 contribution. So h bar squared, h bar to the 4. And we have a c squared in here. And there is an m in there. And there is a 2 in here. And there is 1 over n cubed. I think we have written all of them down. Here we need the additional c squared to complete it to alpha to the 4. So I will use a different color for that compensation. I will convert this to 4 and put the c squared, correct? And this becomes then the alpha to the 4. And then finally we have 1 over 2 alpha to the 4 mc squared times 1 over n cubed. How nice. You see, all of a sudden, out of that complicated and uh, ugly looking expression, we are having a beautiful thing coming up. So let's split this into what? Into the following. Let me write it as alpha squared divided by 2n squared. Uh, there's n squared times n in here. Put a minus sign in here. So alpha squared, I have split. Put the mc squared next to this. What is remaining is minus alpha squared divided by n, correct? I have split the alpha squared to the 4, 2 
F, two factors and minus and minus cancel. So indeed this is correct. And let's remember that this is the EN0. Fine. So as this is the EN0, so we have the finally delta H3 is minus EN0 alpha squared over N time delta L0. Remember I said we have to put a delta L0 in here because we have discovered that psi non-zero psi at the origin is only coming from the S wave. Therefore, this is the final result. So once the third term is in, what we have to do is we have to add these three contributions, obviously, and come, try to come up with a compact, simple, nice formula. Let's do that. In the remaining 10 minutes, I can do that. By the way, I have to confess one thing. I suppressed the proof of that generalized virial theorem for the following reason. The video capture of this class will go on for two hours today. And then because of some technical difficulties, we are going to have a third hour, but it's not going to be recorded. And that remaining third hour, I will give you the details, my secret of virial theorem, okay? That, <laughs> so don't get panic, it's a, it's a tough one. So we'll go through it, okay? So it won't be under the record. So those other students watching us from other universities won't have the secret revealed of that beautiful theorem. No, it's a joke, we'll somehow give, give that one eventually in the long run. So let me add up these three results. Let me copy them again. I'm not going to copy them. You have the two, one, two first results in your notebooks and third one is there. So let's add them up. Let's do the simple thing first. What is that simple thing? L equals zero case. Let's check. Because obviously we have L equals zero case as the one case and we have two other cases. J equals L minus a half and J equals L plus a half. And let's discuss these uh, step by step. By the way, perhaps this may sound a bit of shooting. Let's say that we have two class, right? One is L equals zero, the other is L different than zero. The L different than zero class, then we are going to split into two. Associated with the J equals L minus a half, J equals L plus a half. Let's carry through the L equals zero case first. So, one, L equals zero. So what I have to do for the L equals zero is sum these I equals from one to three. I have to take the L equals zero from the delta E1. Look at your notes if you want for a brief second. If you set the L equals zero in that delta E1 expression, what you have is the following. Delta E1 is it was EN0 times alpha squared over N. And in that bracket, there was a L plus a half. I'm going to use eraser if you allow me. So that's zero plus a half. If I set L equals zero, minus three over four N. So then this one, this factor becomes, Bu yeşil tahta için değil tabi. So this becomes 2, 1 half, 2 minus 3 over 4n. So that is the contribution coming from delta E1, if you want. a nice formula, but still doesn't say much, right? So what is delta E2 for this case? We have already said that the delta E2, the spin orbit, L equals zero part is what? Zero. So let me write that down too. Q 
trivially so. We don't have to do anything. We knew that it was equal to zero. Delta E3, delta E3 is just itself. It only had an equal zero contribution, remember, nothing else. What was the result now? Minus EN zero. Alpha squared over N, delta L zero. Delta L zero is just one, right? For L equals zero. So what is the sum now? Let me write the sum. Delta EI, I equals from one to three is, EN0, alpha squared over N, the common factor, 2 minus 3 over 4 N, minus 1. So it is 1 minus 3 over 4 N. So we are finished with the N equals 0 case. So let me focus on L different than zero. That's the second group. Obviously the sum will be delta EI will be delta E1 plus delta E2 only. Why? Because delta E3 has only L equals zero. It's finished. I'm done with it, with that result written down. So what is the delta E1? Delta E1 is just, where is it? Here. Let me not rewrite it. Put, this is L, right? For the L equals zero case, I have set it equal to zero. Otherwise, it is this expression as it stands. So what I'm going to do next is go to these two special cases. Because I know that for L equal non, for L different than zero, I have to distinguish between two cases, if not for all, for the sake of the spin orbit. Because for the spin orbit, I have to distinguish between J equals L minus a half and J equals L plus a half. So let me do it. 2A. 2 is L different than zero. A is j equals l minus a half. So what is the delta E1 plus delta E2 for this case? It is EN0 alpha squared over n times 1 over l plus a half minus 3 quarters times 1 over n. That's coming from the delta E1. And what is coming from the delta E2? What is coming from delta E2 is minus L divided by 2L L plus a half L plus 1. I'm just copying the result we have written down. This is the, ah, oh, sorry, this is the, correct this please. I have to start with j equals L plus a half 1. The first term is the same. It doesn't, it doesn't see the spin. So this result is for j equals L plus a half. So I have to be careful with that. So what about the 2b? Let me put some gap in between. J equals L minus a half. So what is again delta E1 plus delta E2 is the factor, prefactors are the same, alpha squared divided by N. 1 over L plus a half minus 3 over 4n and the second term which is plus l plus a half divided by twice l, l plus a half and l plus 1. So these are the two results associated with the 
two subcases of the L different than zero case. That's J equals L plus a half up, J equals L minus a half down. So I have to carry out this algebraic relations and see whether I can get something clean that we will do after a short break.